God of Hope. This is Will Sanchez. My very special guest tonight is Layla Vaziri. I met Layla actually through Vimeo. Vimeo is a video sharing site similar to YouTube. I saw her public service announcement about swimming and saw that she was part of Swim Bike Run SBR right here in New York City. So naturally, I had to reach out to her and invite her to Gotta Run. So please welcome to the show, Layla. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being on the show. Layla, let's get started by sharing with the audience a little bit about your background. Where were you born and raised? A little bit about your family, something about your schooling. Born in New York City. Um, my mother is basically a New Yorker, grew up here most her life. Um, my father's from Iran, moved here in his early 20s, in the, I think like, you know, early 70s or so. Um, and they met here in New York. Me and my brother came afterwards. Um, we lived here for a few years while we were young, and then due to my dad's job, we transferred down to South Florida, where I was at the age of five, um, and grew up down there. So. I, um, although born here, just just came back here within the last year. Otherwise, I've been uh, like located mostly in Florida. You're a champion swimmer, so how did you get into uh, sports at a young age in Florida? I was lucky that we moved to Florida because there is ample uh, swimming down there. There's like pools, canals, lakes, oceans. So uh, I moved down there when I was five. My mom's side of the family. They're not, there were never any competitive swimmers, but they're, you know, everybody enjoys swimming um, and is pretty good at it, but never, never did it competitively. So we moved down there. My mom had taught me how to swim herself. And then when I was, I guess, six or seven, she kind of signed me up for a little kid's team and was like, well, you're going to formally learn the real strokes and, you know, something for you to probably do after school to get your energy out. And uh, so I was kind of, when I was younger, probably like most kids, did a few different sports, tried like, you know, running and uh, gymnastics, tennis, swimming. Florida is so great for just having like, you know, all the opportunity to do any sport, mm -hmm. tons of, all year long, you know, and so I'm, f eventually swimming just kind of I clicked with me more. I was, you know, improving more in swimming. I was taking to it more. And so eventually those other sports kind of fell, fell by my side and I just kind of went with swimming at a certain age. What about in school, high school, college, where you were there, obviously on their swim teams, I would think. Yeah, I was. I was on my high school swim team, Coral Springs High School, and um, and and I was very active with my uh, city team, Coral Springs Swim Club, which, uh, you talk about lucky opportunities and circumstances, we moved down to Coral Springs, Florida, which is a suburb of Fort Lauderdale, suburb of Miami. And I happened to have like the best swim coach um, at that at the team that I locally lived at. You know, a lot of times you kind of a lot of kids are good, and then they kind of reach a certain point and have to look for a better coach or uh, look for a team that suits suits them more. So I really hit it, struck gold from the beginning. I I started with the same coach that I swam with up through after college. I Great. What's his name? Let's give him a shout out. Michael Loberg. Michael Loberg. Yes. Excellent. You said he followed you to college? No, I came back after college oh, okay. and I swam for one more year till Olympic trials 2008. But, but at some point you went from being a very good swimmer to a very, very good swimmer. So how did that <laughs> how did transition that happen? happen? Well, a lot of hard work and a lot of hours and a lot of swimming and being patient, goal setting, that whole thing, definitely. It was a journey. And I reached really my full peak potential, uh, at least we think so far, uh, at about age 20. I was in college. So, and I won world championships and I set a world record and I won nationals. And wow, it was so this what's the world record in? 50 backstroke. Wow. So I'm a sprinter. That, so. This is the, Ameri the world record. So that's, 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 I'm guessing not the United States, but an entire world. Yeah, of well, all that time. must have felt wonderful. It was incredible. So it was uh, a long time putting in a lot of work, but uh, eventually, eventually I got to, yeah, the Okay. Top. In college, did you study any particular subject? I was a communication culture major at Indiana University. 
So oh, you moved out of Florida. I did. I took a big leap and I went to the Midwest. So I was uh, pretty good. And I was always, I was always good. Um, as you know, a swimmer. As a swimmer, I was always good, and uh, I was always like you know, won local meets and was ranked in the country. But as far as like world champion, no, that was that was definitely a surprise even to myself. Was it some kind of international meet? Where did, where was it held when you did the world record? It was world championships and it was held in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Oh, it got another traveling. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> did your family go with you? Yes, my whole family went and they had a great time seeing all of Australia while I got to But sit. you weren't a favorite for the 50 yard backstroke, is that what you're saying? I had never swam it until that meet. You're kidding. No. You never swam no. to 50 yard yeah. backstroke. I had qualified in a 100 backstroke and um, and I I swam decent. I, I I made it into semifinals, and I had just missed making the finals in the hundred oh, back. Of the one hundred. Of the hundred back by like, you know, I don't even know if it was a full tenth of a second. That kind of deal where it's like just some one tiny thing didn't go well, and I missed making well, finals. Swimming is phenomenal because we're all familiar with from the Olympics where the difference between a world champion and the next guy is usually one one hundredth of a second. Exactly. <laughs> and here, with a tenth of a second, you missed out. Exactly. And so, but but you were still qualified for the 50-yard uh, yeah. dash, the 50-yard backstroke. Yeah, it is a dash. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, uh, the coaches were so, so nice. The, the, the U.S. national team is an amazing experience to be part of the coaches and the athletes that like comprise that team. So I was really disappointed with my 100 back, and they were all, oh, it's okay. This is your first big international competition. But I was like, I had trained so hard, and, you know, so they, they were like, well, you know, you have the 50 back you can you can do and it was like a two days later so I just remember sitting and watching the competition for that next day and a half and being so upset that I didn't make a final that I you know and knew how, I could you were 20 have. at that time I was 20 yes I was 20 okay. 21 maybe okay <laughs> well, you were young so you had to make that adjustment that was amazing yeah. because so somehow you 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 relaxed enough to uh, to go for it. Yeah, I I think the I think being upset, the disappointment. I think I, I remember walking out to the 50 back and being like, I am making this final. I'm going to swim in a final here. Not only did I, I, I was seated with like such a bad time, like I never swam it. So I won my heat. Not only that, but I had broken the American record, and I was seated first going into finals. Wow. And so, and I was just off the world record. Wow. And I was like, so I, I had to I had to make up for, you know, not not doing so well in my previous event. <laughs> well, that is an amazing capacity to put out to 100, even though you felt you obsessed about it, yeah. you were still relaxed enough because I've done some swimming and I know you got to be relaxed to be able to do it. So you did it. That is an amazing story. And your family must have been absolutely thrilled. We were all pleasantly shocked. So, so what kind of an award? Did it give you a gold trophy or medal? Yeah, I'm, unfortunately I don't have it to show or bring to the show today. But yeah, they have these beautiful like handcrafted medals that you would be like, oh, it'd be so great to have a medal. But really when you see it up close, it really is very beautiful. It's like every major competition, they have a different artist kind of, you know, create the medal, whatever the the logo is or the image for it and uh, it was beautiful yeah so I have that forever now oh cool and you have it here in New York I, it's home in Florida actually a special I would have brought it yeah it comes in this beautiful wooden box and, and after that uh, did you win any additional awards did you go to the Olympics what was that no the story I missed there? I missed qualifying for the Olympics but uh, so world championships was the year before the Olympics so I did really wonderful I, and so many great things happened after that, being able to be on the national team and travel and go to international competitions for that next year and um, train back home with my club team, be sponsored, that whole, the, the ride of it was amazing. And on Olympic trials itself, I, I made finals and I missed making the team. And, uh, and which again, probably by one tenth, of, you know, fraction of a second. Half a second, but well, that's a good deal. That's, that's a big deal. When <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and uh, it was, yeah, it was obviously, you know, disappointing. But the whole process, the whole journey, was amazing. And if you know, if anybody has ever been to the U.S. Nationals, 
um, Olympic trials for any sport, it is more pressure than the Olympics. U.S. has like the most dominant competition within our country to make teams. So just to be in the running was amazing. And absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. And so, I just have the world record. I, it's probably been broken since those records seem to break every every six month. months or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so no, no, I do not have the record anymore. But anymore. Yeah. well, let's talk about that. What's your take? Uh, I'm a novice of swimming, but I, of course, I, as a layman, I read the stories, and the swimsuits are getting faster. The water, even the water gets faster <laughs> because uh, the, I guess if it's deep enough or something like that. So have swimsuits been getting faster in your opinion? This huge suit craze the year after the Olympics. I just missed it. Um, but they had developed this new, new thicker material, and it covered more of the body, and, um, you know, there were new companies coming out making it, Blue 70, which maybe a lot of triathletes are familiar with that brand. Okay, Blue Speedo, 70. Blue 70, okay. um, Speedo Tier. They started making these like thicker material suits and they s covered like the legs, you know, full legs. Some of them covered the arms. So I missed, I wasn't in it directly, but I hear that, uh, yeah, it ended up being a a big advantage to a lot of swimmers, which I is interesting. I guess to the women, because the men, if I recall, they guess they wear the short speedos. <laughs> yeah. Well, it even covering, like, the men's, the chest. Oh, I think... Oh, oh, they wear some kind of shirt, I guess. Yeah, well, it would be like a, you know, tight, okay. tight, just covering your chest. So oh, okay. the thing is that material cr creates more buoyancy in your body. And so um, now they've... Uh, it's funny how sometimes organizations work. So they, the suit was out for a year, and all these world records were just falling, breaking by a lot, a right, lot, a right. lot. Right, right. But did and they so ultimately outlaw the suit? Then they outlawed it, right? But all those records still stand. Uh, oh, <laughs> my goodness. So, so that suit's not allowed anymore, but uh, the times from those suits are still there. Huh. Even though some of them are getting broken, people are getting closer to them, I'm sure people will eventually get to them and break them, actually, too, wow. without the suit. So. Okay, well, let's go back to college. So you were studying communications and what else? Were you communication and culture. Culture. So you it's got your school. bachelor's to go, and then what happened after school? So, uh, let me see. That was kind of a whirlwind. The world championships and graduating happened that same month. Oh, I was goodness. like graduating college, and I went to world championships. It was it was a whirlwind of a of a month or two. That was like a June or May timetable. Yeah, it was it was uh, what was it March and April. Oh, okay. It was you March graduate and April. early in uh, it's Florida. <laughs> <laughs> the New York area is usually late May, early June. Yeah. Graduation ceremonies. In Indiana, I think like my last class was in April, and by May I was already packing up and coming home and okay. to yeah, Florida. To Florida. Up Okay, so how do you make a, your career decision at that point? Now, now you need a, a job. So that was so interesting. I had been swimming for 15 years. Since I was seven or eight years old, I had been like competitively swimming. So I knew that I needed to take a break. I just knew it. I would just, it was, you know, it was an amazing ride up to that point, and I just knew I needed to kind of like step away from competing and being in training every day. So I decided I'm going to be done, but I had no idea really what I was going to do or what I was kind of stepping into after that. So uh, interestingly enough, I just had to kind of totally step away. I worked at a solar energy company in South Florida. I worked in uh, fundraising for the city of Fort Lauderdale. I worked at a museum doing fundraising. So for about two years, I was out of the scene, out of the swimming world. I just kind of needed to, you know. Find yourself. Find myself. <laughs> so lose you myself, swam for find pleasure myself. at that point. I wasn't even swimming, swimming. for pleasure. I wasn't even swimming oh, was the okay. funny thing. So you, your athletic uh, endeavors went to, to zero? <laughs> Not even tennis or running? For a tiny bit of time, it did, which is so funny. And I had zero, you know, I totally walked, like, blindly away from it. Like, I don't even know what's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to feel to swim. I don't know what's going to happen to my body or my energy. Or, And that was interesting. It's your... You're in for a treat if you're about to end your sport. You it, you definitely go through a period of uh, fluctuation in your in your energy and your uh, appetite and your hormone level and your everything. So it takes a little bit for you to kind of find a new equilibrium. I think. Do you have any kind of a support group? You know, former uh, champions 
group uh, on Facebook or something <laughs> could talk about, well, what happens uh, after, <laughs> after being a champion? I should have found one. Actually, somebody should set one up. I should help set one up. I mean, there definitely, it, it would be helpful. I was lucky that some of the girls on the college team before me were done a year or two before me, and I remember calling them after a few months of being done and being like, what is going on? I feel so weird. And uh, then being like, yeah, that's, you kind of go through this adjustment phase. So, um, it, well, Obviously, yeah. you overcame it and you came to New York at some I point. I did, yeah. So what happened? So I was home in Florida, away from s swimming for about two years, and then um, decided that I wanted to come to New York City. And my brother was living here. My, I have aunts and uncles who live here. I have lots of family in New York, so it wasn't just a total. You were born here. So. And I was born here, yeah, yeah, exactly. Come back to it. So I moved up here. About a year ago, you said? About a year ago, yeah. And I, for the first two or three months, I was staying with my family, and I was uh, coaching, but just part-time, just because it was just good to be in the community of people that I knew and figuring out what kind of job I wanted. And then I, so luckily, coincidentally, this great um, f head coach position at SBR, Swim, Bike, Run, opened up. And uh, surprisingly enough, the coach that was leaving and I sort of knew each other. Stefan Bill. Stefan Bill, exactly. So he, he relocated to London. And I went in for an interview and got the job, and I had been here for two, three months, and I was so lucky that my timing was good. <laughs> excellent, yeah. excellent opportunity. SBR is very well known in the New York area. They do besides swimming, bike, and run. Their name it designates. Tell us about your program there, because that's how I stumbled across you on Vimeo, because you had this terrific video was very well done, quality, it was very vivid. You can actually almost see the, the water on your arm. We were obviously outside the pool. So tell us about your program. How does it work? The majority of people I work with are triathletes. However, it being New York City and just having tons of other potential clientele, I also work with people who are water phobic. I also coach sometimes kids. I've coached a few pregnant women. We have at SBR an endless pool, which was the first time I came in contact with one. In Florida, I don't know if I, if there exists an endless pool. <laughs> but this is New York. Space is exactly. at a premium, so some clever fellow exactly. invented the endless pool. So describe that to our audience. So the endless pool is like a current regulated, resistance regulated pool. So you will swim in place. The pool, it's about eight feet wide maybe 15 feet long, mm -hmm. and it has a motor in it, so it creates this like tunnel of water that kind of comes at you that you can regulate the speed of. And um, it is a really interesting pool to coach in, and I actually think it has a lot of benefits to it, actually. Get to... What well, some of the benefits have you seen? It creates a lot of, you know, water resistance. You have to swim into a current rather than with a current, right? So you're swimming into this current. So with a lot of the swimmers that I coach, I can say, you know, we're working on efficiency. This, that swimming is so, so focused on technique and efficiency. And so when we turn this thing on and the resistance is blasting at them, it, I can easily say, well, look, look at all the drag you're creating. Look at this, you know, look at the part of your body that's out of alignment. You, sometimes you videotape from below. That's possible as well, which I think is really good feedback to kind of see what you're doing yourself in the water. I must so. admit, I, I've been to the endless pool once at New Pulse, and I loved it. <laughs> but I also loved the fact that the instructor at, at New Pulse uh, got into the pool with you, with me. Do you get into the pool with? I guess it depends on the client. I would imagine. Yeah, it depends on the client, depending on like how comfortable they are in the water. Yet, I would say if somebody's not comfortable in the water, I definitely get in with them because I think just being with them, you know, facilitates like them being calm. But I I coach some people who are really really good swimmers, so then that would just be me getting in their way. I think <laughs> so. I stay on deck for that. Great. So how does uh, do you find clients for the SBR? swim team or the swim uh, in your particular program because do they do other training uh, like bikes it's, i think they do they right? do we do we have like an incredible biking coach also Anne marie she herself is like a world champion bike 
stuff. I see them in Central Park. Runners are jealous of triathletes because for some reason they know how to wear clothing. I mean, you know, the, the suits. They just look so terrific on the bikes. And, <laughs> and runners, you know, we don't quite get coordinated as the triathletes. So, I, yes, I, I see them in Central Park when yeah. they're doing their brick workouts. Yeah, yeah. So you are strictly swimming in the in the endless pool at SBR. Mm -hmm. Now, to talk about the video because that's how I stumbled across it. And when I was struck by it, it was very, very informative. You took your time in explaining three topics. The mermaid kick, and then something with your fingers in the middle, and then I think the third one, something with a uh, windshield wiper. Describe those, and why did you pick those three as opposed to, you know, dozens of others? Well, yes, all those funny names for those drills I created. Um, well, I thought, well, first of all, working with triathletes has been so exciting and such a good experience for me because I come from just swimming, swimming background, swimming community. So getting to know triathletes, getting to know runners and bikers has been a um, learning experience for me, just about how, you know, other movements, uh, people are used to doing certain things with their legs and their hips and certain kind of coordination that comes from a running background, comes from a biking background. So uh, that's been really interesting for me. So I created these funny drills, mermaid legs, fingertip drag, windshield wiper, a few other funny names that... Uh, well, tell us, what, what's the mermaid drill? One thing I noticed that a lot of bikers do and a lot of runners, that they are used to having these like wide strides in their legs, right? Having like big wide movements from your hip like legs being really wide so the thing that they have to get used to when it comes to swimming is that legs stay together more it's more of a your thighs stay together and you kick like with your feet more um, I suppose keep the knees locked or semi locked no not even the knees locked the knees can be relaxed but just your thighs stay together so when you're kicking your legs are more um, you know, they're more kind of aligned behind you. It's not like big, so wide So are you pushing, for using your hips in that case? Yeah, the kick comes from your, from hips. your hips and then like kind of through your ankles, through your feet. I, I must admit, I'm, I've been a poor student of swimming. I, I struggled. Very difficult for me to kick from my hips for some reason. And, and the coach used to say, you know, I'm kicking too much with using my knees. Oh, yeah. And, and, and apparently runners have that problem of uh, overcoming not using their knees. Yes. But the mermaid drills in your experience, helps in overcoming some of those issues. I made up that name because I think it's good to have some kind of visual to, that goes along with the feeling. So I say like a mermaid's tail, you know, she kicks like just her legs are together and you kick out more from your ankles and your feet. So I'm trying to, you know, teach people who have more of a tendency to have bigger strides to think more that it comes more from your feet and your ankles than it will come from your thighs. So, is, is that the, the number one thing to, that runners should learn to do? The, the mermaid drill. You know, is that, a, or does it depend again on the individual what the, what their weaknesses are? I think that the drills I've come up with are ones that are like specific to people who kind of are triathletes at this point. Um, yeah, they have certain tendencies that that just you're used to doing that. I'm sure if I started running or biking, <laughs> it'd be like, what exactly? You must be a swimmer. <laughs> so I think it goes both ways. I think a lot of the drills that, I've, that I work on are actually because there are certain habits that people with a running and biking background just carry into swimming, so. Okay, Look, we're gonna show the video so the audience can see it. Coaching has been a rewarding role for me, allowing me to reach individuals of all ages, from children to adults, and of all levels of ability, from competitive athletes to phobic swimmers, who seek to develop their potential and reach their goals. The next segment of the body that I wanna focus on is the core. The core is the most vital to swimming, it gives us our stability, our flotation, and our rotation. I use the fingertip drag to emphasize high head position, high shoulders, and nice high arms going through the water. You want to swim on top of the water rather than through the water. Through the water you meet a lot more resistance on your head and shoulders. Rather than swimming right on the surface of the water, you're swimming with the current. In fingertip drag, I want you to feel like your fingertips glide right under the surface of the water, right alongside your body, and then reaching forward with your fingertips. In this case, I want you to feel light and like you're swimming just on the surface of the water rather than through it. It's important at the end of our fingertip drag to elongate our fingers forward and reach forward rather than plunging into our deep catch. You want to reach forward so that you have a nice rotated position, 
gliding along the water. When we reach forward, we elongate forward and we are able to glide right on the surface of the water. So let's talk about some of your future challenges because we've only got a few minutes. Sure. So what do you see for yourself uh, ongoing in New York City? Do you have your own apartment and all that? Are you settled in? I do. I do. I've, I'm living um, in Hell's Kitchen now, and I love that neighborhood. I've jumped around a few different neighborhoods in the city. Uh, I love New York City. I love being here. And uh, what do I see myself? I. I think that uh, this coaching job at SBR has been such a good opportunity and I'm trying to um, use it to, you know, become the best kind of coach that I can be at this point. And I love that New York City has tons of new kind of fitness regiments and, you know, uh, schools of different kind of uh, exercise and this and that. So I've tried out a few. And I think that's, for, for me at least, through coaching, I kind of pull from outside things that kind of give me insight and, and inspire me in my own like coaching. So I've uh, tried a few different yoga studios in the city. I love that, you know, and uh, gyrotonics. Have you heard of that? I want to try that. that. It's kind of like a Pilates yoga thing and it's a new trend with different machines and this and that. And I think if I, if I, uh, yeah, I like experimenting with different kinds of exercise and this and that. So New well, York's great for Excellent. That. I think uh, a good coach has to be open to new ideas and new experiences. So again, I want to wish you all the success in the world, coming back to New York Thank and you. discovering a new niche for yourself and teaching others to swim in all sorts of different ways. Thank you so much for stopping in. Thank you so much for having me.